All fucking righty then, folks. This is the first of probably the only fucking episode of the Doughboy podcast. That name is not fucking permanent, nor has it been agreed upon. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to be talking about Who Will Greet You at Home by Leslie Ineka Arima. I have no idea if I pronounced that right. I probably fucking didn't, but you know what? You know what? We respect the hustle here at the Doughboy Podcast, which again is not an agreed upon name, nor is it final. Let's begin, guys. Is this is this gonna be a fucking glorified audio? This is gonna be a glorified audio book, but with like slight commentary. You know what? It's not like I'm making money off of this. Who gives a fuck about plagiarism? Ian, you, you fucking know. One. The yarn baby lasted a good month, emitting dry, cotton-soft gurgles and pooping little balls of lint, before Ogechi snagged its thigh on a nail and it unraveled as she continued walking, mistaking its little huffs for the beginnings of hunger, not the cries of an infant being undone. That last bit, the, the, the cries of the infant, that's the first line that I underlined, because yes, folks, we had to fucking make notes for this. Well, not notes, but like annotate it for Thompson. And... See, I just had a fucking pencil and the big old, big old brain boy that I have in my head. So instead of actually making some decent fucking notes, I decided to just underline the shit that sounded metal. And you know what? At the end of the day, that's all we fucking need. You know, we just want this shit to be metal. Okay. And the cries of an infant being undone is an objectively metal sentence. All right. All right. So. Let's keep on fucking reading, shall we? We're gonna say fuck a lot. You guys better be listening to this with headphones on, or at least, like, alone. Because as you fucking know, <laughs> I say fuck a lot, you know? Shit, anyways. That's that's another good one, shit. Jesus Christ. By the time she noticed, it was too late. The leg of a tangle... Blah, 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 blah. We're keeping that in, guys, because I'm too lazy to edit this shit. So you guys are gonna have to deal with me making a lot of gibberish sounds whenever I stumble over my words, all right? It was too late, the leg a tangle of fiber, and she pulled the string the rest of the way to end it, rather than have the infant grow up to be maimed. If she was to mother a child, to mute and subdue and fold away parts of herself, the child had to be perfect. Now, that is, like, that's the first stanza that I just ended. That, or not stanza, this isn't a fucking poem. That's, like, the first paragraph that I'm ending on, and... Like, this just tells you everything you need to know about Ogechi, honestly. It tells you that she has, like, this really nice little baby man. Little nice baby man. But then she fucks it up. Well, not actively, but, like, it gets fucked up. And because she's so focused on uh, uh, perfection, which is the main theme of the story, like, chasing perfection and the pain of uh, perfection, because of that, she just straight up fucking aborts the baby prenatally. I don't know how you prenatally abort a baby that hasn't even been in the womb yet, but she fucking does it. Do babies in this... I don't think... Do women even have wombs in this universe? Because the whole thing is that everybody makes their baby... Like, literally makes their babies. So do women even have... Does sex even happen in this story? I'm getting, like, super off fucking track, by the way. But anyways, that's the setup to the main theme, perfection... It has to be perfect. The child has to be perfect. All right. Next paragraph. Yarn had been a foolish choice, she knew. The stuff for women of leisure, who could cradle wool in the comfort of their own cars, and in secure houses devoid of loose nails. Not for an assistant hairdresser who took Donfo to work if she had money, walked if she didn't, and lived in an apartment that amounted to a room she could clear in three large steps. So, yes, ladies and gentlemen, she is poor and at the end of the day what are poor people even for you know that was a fucking joke i'm not getting canceled over that shit all right where was i women like her had to form their children out of a sturdier more practical material to withstand the dents and scrapes that came with a life like hers her mother had formed her from mud and twigs and wrapped her limbs tightly with leaves like moin moin pedestrian items that had produced a pedestrian girl 
Ogechi was determined that her child would be a thing of whimsy, soft and pretty and tender and worthy of love, but first she had to go to work. See, that little thing about, like, oh, it has to be worthy of love because it's soft and pretty, that is the other main point of the story. Just because it's perfect, just because it's, like, rough, it doesn't mean that it's not deserving of love. Everything is worthy- well, not everything. Most things are worthy of love. Even mud babies, that's gonna come back, even mud babies are deserving of love. You know? And that's, like, the whole thing. You know? You fucking know, you know, you know. All right, so where were we? She brushed her short crappie, crappie, fucking, fucking, fuck, you know, fuck. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. She brushed her short choppy hair and pulled on one of her two dresses. Her next child would have thirty dresses, she decided, and hair so long it would take hours to braid. And she would complain about it to anyone who would listen. All the while exuding smug pride. See, that's the thing about Ogechi. Is this still recording? Yes, it's still recording. It's just being weird. Okay, that's the thing about Ogechi. She she wants a perfect baby, but not because she wants to be a perfect mother or just because she wants the baby to have a good life. I mean, she does. Don't get me wrong. She's not, like, hating on the baby or anything. But the only... The main reason... Not the only, but the main reason that she wants the baby to be perfect is because she wants to live vicariously through the baby. She has such, like... I don't remember the term. It's not imposter syndrome, but it's, like, because she knows that she was made out of, like, mud and sticks and stuff like that, which, uh, tangent, is probably just, like, not extremely subtle, but also a semi-subtle allegory for, like, kids being born into poverty, having, like, self-conscious issues and stuff like that, you know? But anyways... Because she knows, like, she was a mud baby and, like, oh, it's just this poor woman's thing and uh, She thinks that she is not perfect and she is not deserving of love and attention and all this stuff. So she feels the need to prove to herself and to others that sh- she does have a perfect life. Because look, look at this child that I made. It's perfect. It's, it's, it's great. It's delicate, you know? But that's not the point of the child. The point of the child isn't to... Fucking, this is getting way too serious, way too quickly. We are, like, eight minutes in. Jesus Christ. Anyways, the point of the child isn't to serve the parents, like, uh, not delusions, but, like, to serve their image or their ego. The point of the child is to have a child, you know, to have a little bouncing baby boy or girl or they them, you know? Just have a little guy, have a little scrapper, you know? Take care of him, love him, give him life, you know? Don't have smug pride about complaining about them. That's mean. Anyways. Ogechi treated herself to a bus ride, only to regret it. Two basket weavers sat in the back row with woven raffia babies in their laps. One had plain raffia streaked with blue and greens, while the other's baby was entirely red, and every passenger admired them. They would grow up to be tough and bright and skillful, the children were not yet alive, so the passengers sang the call and response that custom dictated. Where are you going? I am going home. Who will greet you at home? My mother will greet me. Next page. <laughs> we're one page in already, folks. What will your mother do? My mother will bless me and my child. It was a joyous occasion in a young woman's life when her mother blessed her child into life. I fucked that up so hard. The two girls flushed and smiled with pleasure when another woman commended their handiwork, such tight, lovely stitches, and wished them well. Ogechi wished them death by drowning, though not out loud. The congratulations women turned to her, eager to sp- I, I fucked that up. The congratulating woman turned to her, eager to spread her adoration. But once she had looked at Ogechi over, why can't I fucking read? But once she had looked Ogechi over, seen the threadbare dress, the empty lap, and the entirety of her unremarkable package, she just gave an embarrassed smile and studied her fingers. Ogechi stared at her for the rest of the ride, hoping to make her uncomfortable. See, that's why we love Ogechi. She sees happy people, she wants them to fucking drown. That's so me-coded when I see literally any happy couple anywhere. You know, just die. And then she just, like, the woman looks at her and she's like, oh, uh, or she's wanting to go, uh, 
But then she she realizes that Ogechi doesn't have a fucking baby and that she has nothing going for her. So she just shuts up and like twiddles her fingers. And then Ogechi, Ogechi just looks at her for the whole fucking bus ride. Just like, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Like, it's so fucking fun. I love Ogechi. She's such an icon. All right, so that was the end of part one of like, how many parts is it? I think 12? question mark uh 11 part uh 11 parts all right so we're on part two guys when ogechi had taken her first baby a pillowy thing made of cotton tufts to her mother the old woman had guffawed blowing out so much air she should have fainted she'd taken she then taken the molded form from ogechi grip it grip grip Grip, folks, you know, just gotta grip it and strip it. What the fuck does that mean? She'd then taken the molded form from Ogechi, gripped it under its armpits, and pulled it in half. Just more of that, like, not black comedy, but just, like, metal shit (laughs) that happens in the store. Like, imagine you go to your mother with this, like, very, like, about-to-be-alive child. This is the equivalent of a fetus in this universe. Like, it hasn't been brought to life yet by the blessing or whatever. But it's like, it's it's right there, you know? And she just fucking rips it in half in front. It's so fucking metal. That's not even the worst one. <laughs> All right, anyways. This thing will grow fat and useless, she said. You need something with strong limbs that can plow and haul and scrub. Soft children with hard lives go mad or die young. Bring me a child with edges that I will bless, and you can raise it however you like. When Ogechi had instead brought her mother a paper child woven from the prettiest wrapping paper she'd been able to scavenge, her mother, laughing the whole time, had plunged it into the mop bucket until it softened and fell apart. Again, this shit is metal as fuck and I love it. Ogechi had slapped her and her mother had slapped her back and slapped her again and again till the neighbors heard the commotion and pulled the two women apart. Ogechi ran away that night and vowed never to return to her mother's house. All right, that's the end of part two. Part three. At her stop, Ogechi alighted and picked her way through the crowded streets until she reached Mama Said Hair Emporium, where she worked. That was a weird pause. Mama, who... (laughs) Mama also owned this... What the fuck? (laughs) Mama also owned the store next door, an eatery to some, but to others like Ogechi, a place where the owner would bless the babies of motherless girls for a fee. And Ogechi still owed that fee for the yarn boy who was now unraveled. That's such a, like, this part, that, like, line isn't metal, per se, but it's just so good. Like, the yarn boy who was now unraveled. It's so dramatic. When she stepped into the emporium, the other assistant hairdressers noticed her empty arms and snickered. They'd warned her about the yarn, hadn't they? Ogechi refused to let the sting of tears in her eyes manifest and grab the closet broom. Soon, clients trickled in. And the other girls washed and prepped their hair for Mama while Ogechi swept up the hair shed from scalps and wigs and weaves. I gotta drink some water because my mouth is dry. Stay hydrated or you're gonna die. Drated. That was terrible. Anyways, soon I read that part. (laughs) Mama arrived just as the first customer had begun to lose patience and soothed her with compliments. She noted Ogechi's empty arms with a resigned shake, next page, of her head and went to work, curling, sewing, perming, until the women were satisfied, or in too- What the fuck just happened to my throat? Pause. Or in too much of a hurry to care. Shortly after three, the two younger assistants left together, avoiding eye contact with Ogechi, but smirking as if they knew what came next. Mama dismissed this. The remaining customer had stroked a display wig, waiting. Mama, I... Where's the money? It was routine... It was a routine Mama refused to skip. She knew perfectly well that Ogechi didn't have the money. Ogechi lived in one of Mama's buildings where she paid in rent almost all of the meager salary she earned and ate only once a day at Mama's canteen next door. I don't have it. Well, what you will... What the fuck? Jesus. Well, what will you give me instead? Ogechi knew better than to suggest something. Mama, what do you want? I want just a bit more of your joy, Ogechi. The woman had already taken most of her empathy, so that she found herself spitting in the palms of beggars. She'd started on joy the last time, agreed to bliss- Fuck me. 
She'd started on joy the last time, agreeing to bless the yarn boy only if Ogechi siphoned a bit, just a dab to her. All that empathy and joy and who knows what else Mama took from her and the other desperate girls who visited her back room kept her blessing active long past when it should have faded. Ogechi tried to think of it as a fair trade, a little bit of her life for her child's life, anything but go back to her own mother and her practical demands. See, that's so funny about Ogechi, because, like, she is so clearly, like, such an idealist. Like, she is spitting at the hands of, quote, practical demands. But it's like, you usually think of idealists as, like, super optimistic and, like, super happy-go-lucky. But, like, here, she is a poor, impoverished, and, like, just so fucking stressed out woman. But, but like, she just wants something that, realistically, she can't have. Or she can, but it's, like not worth the effort when she could have something just as good if not better for way less effort and way less like fighting for it you know it's it's so good all right yes mama you can have it mama touched ogechi's shoulder and she felt a little bit sad but nothing she wouldn't shake off in a few days it was an even trade why don't you finish up in here while i check on the food Mama was not gone for three minutes when a young woman walked in. She was stunning, with long natural hair and delicate fingers and skin as smooth and clear as fine chocolate. In her hands was something that Ogechi wouldn't have believed existed if she didn't see it with her own eyes. The baby was porcelain, with a smooth, glazed face wearing a precious smirk. It wore a frilly white dress and frilly socks and soft-soled shoes that would n have never touched the ground. Only a very wealthy and lucky woman would be able to keep such a delicate thing unbroken for the full year it would take before the child became flesh. I just want to think about, like, the the implications of that. Like, like we have babies made of mud and sticks and porcelain and eventually uh -huh, hair. What is the process of turning that into flesh? Like, what, like, if you were to, like, record that on your fucking phone or some shit or just, like, look at it happen... First of all, is it, like, an instantaneous thing where it's just, like, blah, mama, you know? Or is it, like, a weird, like, reverse fucking Indiana Jones Nazi melt thing where it's, like, the meat just, like, <laughs> arises from the fucking soul or... I don't know. I, I, this needs to be a movie. Or, like, at least a short film, you know? Anyways. Um... Okay. I am looking for this mama woman. Is this her place? Ogechi collected herself enough to direct the girl next door, then fell into a fit of jealous tears. Such a baby would never be hers. Even the raffia child of that morning seemed like dirty sponges meant to, next page, soak up misfortune when compared with the China child to whom misfortune would never stick. That was a terrible read. I am sorry. If Ogechi's mother had seen the child, she would have laughed at how ridiculous such a baby would be. What constant coddling she would need. It would never occur to her that mud daughters needed coddling, too. Boom. Another thesis statement right there. Mud, mud, mud daughters need coddling, too. They, they deserve and need love just as much as some porcelain doll. You know? All right. Is this still part three? God damn, I forgot how long part three is. Anyways. Where would Ogechi get her hands on such beautiful material? The only things here that were glossy... I can't read. The only things here were the glossy magazines that advertised the latest styles, empty product bottles which Mama would fill with scented water and try to sell, and hair. Hair everywhere. Short, long, fake, real, obsidian black, delusional blonde, bright, bright red. Ogechi up upended the bag she'd swept the hair into, and it landed in a pile studded with debris. She grabbed a handful and shook off the dirt. Would she dare? After plugging one of the sinks, she poured ha she poured in a half a cup of Mama's most expensive shampoo. When the basin was filled with water and frothy with foam, she plunged the hair into it and began to scrub. She filled the sink twice more until the water was clear. Then she soaked the bundle in the matching conditioner, rinsed and toweled it dry. Next, she gathered up the silky strands and began to wind them, round and round until they became a ball be I apologize, what just happened with my brain? Round and round until the ball of hair became a body and nubs became arms, fingers. The strands tangled together to become nearly impenetrable. 
This baby would not snag and unra unravel. This baby would not dissolve in water or rain or nail polish remover, as the plastic baby had that time. This was not a sugar and spice child to be swarmed with ants and disintegrate into syrup in less than a day. This was no practice baby formed of mud that she would toss into the drain miles away from her phone. Home. Phone? Phone home. Am I fucking E.T. anyways? Jesus. The idea of her making, like, a, quote, practice baby that's, like, made of mud and then chucking it into the drain is so fucking, like, family guy prom night dumpster baby coded. That's such a specific reference, but, like, <laughs> that, it's, that, that's basically the equivalent. She's just chucking a baby into the fucking garbage. It's hilarious. All right. She wrapped it in a headscarf and went to find Mama. The beautiful woman and her beautiful baby had concluded their business. Mama sat in her room, counting out a boggling sum of money. Only after she was done did she wave Ogechi forward. Another one? Yes, Mama. Ogechi did not uncover the child, and Mama didn't ask, long since bored by the girl's antics. They sang the traditional song. Where are you going? I am going home. Who will greet you at home? My mother will greet me. What will your mother do? My mother will bless me and my child. Mama continued with her own special verse. What does Mama need to bless this child? Next page. Mama needs whatever I have. What do you have? I have no money. What do you have? I have no goods. What do you have? I have a full heart. What does Mama need to bless this child? Mama needs a full heart. Then Mama blessed her and the baby and, in lieu of a celebratory feast, gave Ogechi one free meat pie. Then she took a little bit more of Ogechi's joy. End of part three. Start part four. <clears throat> need more water. Scrumptious. There was a good reason for Ogechi not to lift the cloth and let Mama see the child. For one, it was made of items found in Mama's store, and even though they were trash, Mama would add this to her ledger of debts. Second, everybody knew how risky it was to make a child out of hair, infused with the identity of the person who had shed it. But a child of many hairs? Forbidden. But the baby was glossy, and the red streaks glinted just so in the light, and it was sturdy enough to last a full year, easy. And after that year, she would take it to her mother and throw it, not it the baby, but the idea of it, in her mother's face. That's such a hilarious, like, little parentheses thing. Like, not it the baby, guys, the idea of it. Like, <laughs> it's just good little touches like that. She kept the baby covered even on the bus where the people gave her coy glances and someone tried to sing the song, but Ogechi stared ahead and did not respond to her call. More of Ogechi just being a fucking introverted icon. She's probably not even that introverted. But, like, just more of her being a fucking icon and just, like, just fucking with people. <laughs> the sidewalk leading to the door of her little room was so dirty she tiptoed along it, thinking that if her landlord weren't mama, she would complain. In her room, she laid the baby on an old pillow in an orphan drawer. In the morning, it would come to life, and in a year, it would be strong and pretty thing. The idea of an orphaned drawer is so funny, because it could mean one of two things. Either orphaned, as in the drawer was like like a literal drawer and just taken out of the cabinet or whatever, like it was like removed, or orphaned, as in <laughs> like that's where she put her other babies that were all fucking murdered. I, I like the second interpretation. It's probably not the right interpretation, but it's just a lot funnier, you know? All right. Um, okay, that's the end of part four. Start part five. There was an old tale about hair children. Long ago, girls would collect their sheddings every day until they had a bundle large enough to spin a child. One day, a storm blew through the town and every bundle was swept from its hiding place into the middle of the market where the hairs became entangled and matted together. The young women tried desperately to separate their their own hairs from, next page, the others. The elder mothers were amused at the girls' his, histrionics, how, how they argued over the silkiest patches and the longest strands. They settled their commotion thus. Every girl would draw out one strand from every bundle until they all had an equal share. Some grumbled, some rejoiced, but all complied, and each woman went home with an identical roll. When the time came for the babies to be blessed... All the girls came forward, each bundle arriving in the required thickness at the same time. There was an enormous celebration of this once-in-an-age event, and tearful mothers blessed their tearful daughters' children to life. The next morning, all the new mothers were gone. 
some with no sign, others reduced to piles of bones stripped clean. Others' bones? Not so much. But that was just an old tale. End of part five. <laughs> yeah, part five is fucking metal too. End of part five, start part six. Oh, this is another long part. More water. God damn, for someone who talks so much, you'd think I'd be used to having a dry mouth. The baby was awake in the morning, crying dry sounds, like stalks of wheat rubbing together. Ogechi ran to it and smiled with the fibrous eyeless face turned to her. Hello, child. I am your mother. But still it cried, hungry. Ogechi tried to feed it the detergent she'd given to the yarn one, but it, pra but it passed through the baby as if through a sieve. Even though she knew it wouldn't work, she tried the sugar water she had given to the candy child with the same result. She cradled the child, the scritch of its cries grating her ears, and as she drew a deep breath of exasperation, her nose filled with the scent of Mama's expensive shampoo and conditioner, answering her question. The idea of her, like, trying to feed the baby fucking, like, <laughs> trying to feed it laundry detergent and fucking sugar water is hilarious. Also, what was she planning with the sugar child? Did she want it to be, like, the sweetest child in the universe? Like, what was happening there? Anyways, you're going to be an expensive baby, aren't you? Ogechi said, with no heat. A child that cost much, brought much. Again, there's that thing of Ogechi, like, not necessarily, like, blaming the child for anything or, like, being like, oh, this child is making me work so hard. Blah, blah, blah. Like, she, she's not saying this with heat. It's, like, supposed to be joking. But, like... She still has that mindset of this baby is going to reflect on me and it's going to be a reflection of me. You know? It's like, you know? You know. Anyways. Ogechi swaddled it, ripping her second dress into strips that she wound around the baby's torso and limbs until it was almost fully covered, save for where Ogechi imagined the nose and mouth to be. She tried to make do with her own shampoo for now, which was about as luxurious as the bottom of a slow drain. Hol hilarious line. But the baby refused it. Only when Ogechi strapped the child to her back did she find out what it wanted. The baby wriggled upwards, and Ogechi hauled it higher, then higher still, until it settled its head on the back of her neck, and she felt it, the gentle suckling of her nape, as the child drew the tangled buds of hair into its mouth. Ah... Now this she could manage. Like, yeah, go, go, queen. Fucking let the baby eat your hair. Ogechi decided to walk today, unsure of how to nurse the child on the bus, and still kept it secret. But she dreaded the, bu the busy intersection she would cross as she neared Mama's Emporium. The people milling about with curious eyes, the beggars scanning and calculating the worth of passersby. Someone would notice, ask. But as she reached the crossing, not one person looked at her. They were all gathered in a crowd, staring at something that was, block that was blocked from Ogechi's sight by the press of the bodies. After watching a woman try and fail to haul herself onto the low-hanging roof of a nearby building for a better view, Ogechi pulled next page, herself up in one, albeit labored, move. If we didn't need conversa uh, confirm conversation, Jesus. If we didn't need confirmation, Ogechi's fucking Spider-Woman. Then, in, like, you know, slay. Mud girls were good for something. Again, there's that thing of, like, being called mud girls, which, like, that feels like a slur. <laughs> like, deadass, that is a fucking slur if I've ever heard one. Fucking mud baby, come on now. But, like, it's again, it's that thing of, like, she believes that she is not worth anything because she was made of mud. But the things you're made out of don't make you. The things that you do and the person that you are is what makes you you, you know? Anyways, she ignored the woman stretching her arms out for assistance and stood up to see what had drawn the crowd. Again, Ogechi's just like a fucking icon. Like, she just does not give a single fuck throughout the whole story. It's so funny. A girl stood with her mother, and though Ogechi could not hear them from where she perched, the stance, the working of their mouths, all familiar. They were revealing a child in public? In the middle of the day? Even a girl like her knew how terribly vulgar this was. Again, a girl like her. It's like, ugh, you know? In a good way. Um, it was no wonder the crowd had gathered. Only a child of some magnitude would be unwrapped in public this way. What was this one? Gold? 
No, the woman and the girl were not dressed finely enough for that. Their clothes were no better than Ogechi's. The child startled Ogechi when it moved. What she what she thought was an obscene ruffle on the front of the girl's dress was in fact the baby. <laughs> Jesus Christ. No more than interlocking twigs and sticks. Was that grass? Bound with old clothes. Scraps. A rubbish baby. Objectively hilarious line. A rubbish baby. <laughs> it Who the fuck is at my door? Hold on. All fucking righty then. It has been an entire day since I have started recording again because, you know, shit. So, we ended off at Quote, a rubbish baby. That is an objectively funny starting and stopping point. So anyways, let's get fucking back into it, folks. I know it feels like it's only been five seconds for you, because it fucking has. But for me, it's been a whole day. So you're gonna have to fucking deal with it. <laughs> Alright. A rubbish baby. It cried, the friction of sound so frantic and dry, Ogechi imagined a fire flickering from the child's mouth. Or that, like, just metal description shit that is so good about this story. I know you can hear my chair, I'm sorry. Um, a hiccup interrupted the noise, and when it resumed, it was a human cry. The girl's mother laughed and danced, and the girl just cried, pressing the baby to her breast. They uncovered the child together, shucking a thick skin of cloth and sticks, and Ogechi leaned as far as she could without falling from the roof to see what special attribute might have required a public showing. The crowd was as disappointed as she was. It was just an ordinary child with an ordinary face. They started to disperse, some throwing insults at the two mothers and the baby that they held between them for wasting everybody's time. Others congratulated them with enthusiasm. It was a baby, after all. Something didn't add up, though, and Ogechi was reluctant to leave until she understood what nagged her about the scene. So there's more of that thing where it's like, people are expecting these babies to be, like, so special and so, like, whoa, and, like, well, specifically, like, they expect all these, like, frail-made babies of, like, fine cloths and porcelain and shit to be, like, perfect, while, like, just regular kids made of, like, mud and sticks and stuff are just, like, terrible and ugly. But, like, it's a baby, you know? It was a baby after all. That is the quote that is important, you know? All right. Um, It was the new mother's face. The child was as plain as pap, but the mother's face was full of wonder. One would think the baby had been spun from silk. One would think the baby was speckled with diamonds. One would think the baby was loved. Mother cradled mother, who cradled child, a tangle of ordinary limbs of ordinary women. And yeah, again, just continuing that thing of like, like she thinks that because the mother is so in awe, it must have been, like, some special child. But no, it was, like, a regular kid. It's just, a, it's just a regular little baby man, you know? But she just can't understand the idea of someone being made from, like, not even being made, but just, like, someone of a lower class or someone of, like, just average nature being loved. Because, like, everyone, not everyone, most people, especially, like, just babies who have no, like, moral karma markings yet, they deserve love. They, like, they deserve love just as much as a rich kid does, you know? All right, anyways. There has to be more than this for me, Ogechi thought. More of her, like, just wanting to raise some perfect child for, like, quote-unquote perfect child for literally no reason. Um, at the shop, the two young assistants prepped their stations and rolled their eyes at the sight of Ogechi and the live child strapped to her back. Custom forced politeness from them, and with gritted teeth they sang... Welcome to the new- welcome to the new mother, I am welcomed. Welcome to the new child, the child is welcomed. May her days be longer than the breasts of an old mother and fuller than the stomach of a rich man. That line is fucking hilarious. Like, they're just- <laughs> Like, yeah, fuller than the stomach of a rich man, that's dope. But <laughs> days longer than the breasts of an old mother is hilarious. Like, where- Why are you making fun of this old lady's saggy tits? Like, what is happening here, guys? Anyways- <laughs> The second the words were out, they went back to work, as though the song were a sneeze to be excused and forgotten. Until, that is, they took in Ogechi's self-satisfied air, so different from the anxiousness that had followed in her wake whenever she had blessed a child in the past. The two girls were fo forced into deference, stepping aside as Ogechi swept to where they would have stood still a mere day ago. When Mama walked in, she paused, sensing the shift of power in the room, but it was nothing. Next page. 
It was nothing to her. She was still the head. What matter if one toenail would argue with the other? That's such, like, a good analogy for, like, a narcissist. <laughs> like, just, oh, I'm the head of this body, so who gives a fuck about the toenail? That's, like, such a good analogy. Because, like, yes, your head is objectively, like, top three most important, like, parts of the body. But, like, if your toenail was, like, if you fuck, if you stub your toe, you're still gonna feel that shit. You're still gonna be like, oh, fuck, what the, ah, uh, you know, you're still gonna, like, be mad. So, like, <laughs> it's a really good analogy, and it's just a funny line. She eyed the bundle on Ogechi's back, but didn't look closer, and wouldn't, as long as the child didn't interfere with the work, and by extension, her coin. Ogechi was grateful for the child's silence, even though the suction on her neck built up over the day to become an unrelenting ache. She tired easily, as if the child were drawing energy from her. Whenever she tried to ease a finger between her nape and the child's mouth, the sucking would quicken, so she learned to leave it alone. At the end of the day, Mama stopped her with a hand on her shoulder. So you were happy with this one? Yes, Mama. Can I have a bit of that happiness? Ogechi knew better than to deny her outright. What can I have in exchange? Mama laughed and let her go. When Ogechi dislodged the child at the end of the day, she found a raw, weeping patch on her nape, where the child had sucked her bald. Just great sentence. Sucked her bald, you know? On the ride home, she, sl <laughs> she slipped to the back of the bus, careful to cradle the child's face against her ear so that no one could see it. The baby immediately latched onto her sideburn, and Ogechi spent the journey like that, the baby sucking an ache into her head. <laughs> Why the fuck did I underline that line? The baby sucking an ache into her head. <laughs> At home, she sheared, off, she sheared off a small patch of hair and fed the child, who took the cottony clumps like a sponge absorbing water. Then it slept, and Ogechi slept too. End of part six, beginning of part seven. Uh, what's 11 minus six? We have that many numbers left, it's five. Jesus, I can't do math. If Mama wondered at Ogechi's sudden ambition, she said nothing. Ogechi volunteered to trim ends. She volunteered to unclog the sink. She kept the store so clean a rumor started that the building was to be sold. She discovered that the child disliked fake hair and would spit it out. Dirty hair was best, flavored with the person whose head it had fallen. Again, like, <laughs> it's, such, it, it's just really good, like, world building while also being, like, just darkly comedic. I don't know if it was, like, intended to be funny, but it's just, it's like... Yeah, dirty hair's the best. Like, what? Like, what? You know? Ogechi managed a steady stream of food for the baby, but it required more and more as each day passed. All the hair she gathered at work would be gone by the next morning, and Ogechi had no choice but to strap the child to her back to, al to allow it to chaw on her dwindling nape. Dwindling nape is, like, such a good line. Um, Mama was not curious about the baby, but the two assistants were. When Ogechi denied their requests for a viewing, their sudden deference returned to malice tenfold. They made extra messes, strewing, strewing hair after Ogechi had cleaned, knocking bottles of shampoo over, until Mama twisted their ears for wasting merchandise. One of the girls, the short one with a nasty scar on her arm, grew bolder, attempting to snatch the cover off the baby's head and laughing and running away when Ogechi reacted. Evading her became exhausting, and Ogechi took to hiding the child in the shop on the day she opened, squeezing it, next page, in among the wigs or behind shelves of unopened shampoos, and the thwarted girl grew petulant, bored, then gave up. First of all, who the fuck do you think you are? <laughs> like, why are you trying to snatch the baby? It's so funny. <laughs> like, they can't be that curious about what she made the baby out of. Like, jeez. It's not like she found, like, a big-ass diamond to make a baby or something. Anyways. One day, while the child was nestled between two wigs, and Ogechi, the other assistants, and Mama were having lunch at the eatery next door, a woman stopped by their table to speak to Mama. Greetings. I am greeted, Mama said. What is it you want? <laughs> Mama say, Mama, Sama, walk you, sir. Jesus. Mama was usually more welcoming to her customers, but this woman owed Mama money, and she subtracted each owed coin from her pleasantries. That's a really good line. Mama, I have come to pay my debt. Is that so? This is the third time you've come to pay your debt, and yet we are still here. I have the money, Mama. Let me see. The woman pulled a pouch from the front of her dress and counted out the money owed. As soon as the notes crossed her palm, Mama was all smiles. More of Mama just being a greedy bitch. <laughs> ah, woman of her word. My dear, sit. You were looking a little rough today. Why don't we get you some hair? 
The woman was too stunned by Mama's kindness to heed the insult. <laughs> Mama shooed one of the other assistants towards the shop, naming a wig the girl should bring. A wig that was near where Ogechi had snatched the stashed the baby, Jesus. I'll get it, Mama, Ogechi said, getting up, but a swift slap to her face sat her back down. Was anyone talking to you, Ogechi? Mama asked. She knew better than to reply. The assistant Mama had addressed snickered on her way out, and the other one smiled into her plate. Ogechi twisted her fingers into the hem of her dress and tried to slow her breathing. Maybe if she was the first to speak to the girl when she returned, she could beg her, or bribe her, anything to keep her baby secret. But the girl didn't return. After a while, the woman who had paid her debt became restless and stood to leave. Mama's tone was, mute, was muted fury. Sit, wait, to Ogechi. Go and- I fucked that up. Sit, wait, pause, to Ogechi. Go and get the wig, and tell that girl that if I see her again, I will have her heart. Mama wasn't accustomed to disobey to being disobeyed. Ogechi hurried to the shop, expecting to find the girl agape at the sight of her strange, fibrous child. But the girl wasn't there. The wig she'd been asked to bring was on the floor, and there, on the ledge where it had been, was the baby. Ogechi pushed it behind another wig and ran the first wig back to Mama. Next page. Who insisted that the woman take it. Then Mama charged her, holding out her hand for payment, and the woman hesitated, but pay. Mama gave nothing for free. She literally wasted this poor woman's time just to make her pay for it anyway. That's so fucking funny. The assistant did not return to the Emporium, and Ogechi worried that she'd gone to call some elder mothers for counsel. But no one stormed the shop, and when Ogechi stepped outside after closing, there was no mob gathered to dispense judgment. The second assistant left as soon as Mama permitted her to, calling for the first one over and over. Ogechi retrieved the baby and went home. And part seven, begin part eight. In her room, Ogechi tried to feed the child, but the hair rolled off its face. She tried again, selecting the strands and clumps it usually favored, but it rejected them all. What do you want? Ogechi asked. Isn't this hair good enough for you? This was said with no malice, and she leaned in to kiss the baby's belly. It was warm and Ogechi drew back from the unexpected heat. First of fucking all, that is a ball of hair. Why are you kissing its belly? Second of all, fucking uh-oh, why is the hair burning? That's not how hair works, guys. <laughs> Anyways, what have you got there? She asks, a record, a, a recoral, Jesus, a rhetorical question to which she did not expect an answer. But then the baby laughed, and Ogechi recognized the sound. It was the snicker she heard whenever she tripped over discarded towels or dropped the broom with her clumsy hands. It was the snicker she'd heard when Mama cracked her across the face at the eatery. Fucking uh-oh. I wonder why that laugh is coming from the fucking baby's stomach. Oopsie. <laughs> I wonder if this has anything to do with, I believe, part five, wherein the backstory said that the mothers were left as piles of fucking bones. But also, did this easy- the- the-, the fuck me. Did this baby eat the bones? Cause like, there was no pile of bones. It was just like, empty. It was just the baby in the wigs. So did this one like, turn into a literal pig and just fucking eat the bones? Anyways, that's off topic. Um... Ogechi distanced herself even more, and the child struggled to watch her, eventually rolling into its side. It stilled when it- What the fuck? Oh, it stilled when she stilled, and so Ogechi stopped moving, even after a whir of snores signaled the child's sleep. Should she call for help? Or tell Mama? Help from who? Tell Mama what exactly? Ogechi weighed her options till sleep weighed her lids. Soon, too soon, it was morning. The baby was crying, hungry. Ogechi neared it with caution. When it saw her, the texture of its cry softened. And I... Why did I pronounce the T and softened so hard? And Ogechi couldn't help it. She softened too. It was hers, wasn't it? For better or for ill, the child was hers. She tried feeding it the hairs again, but it refused them. It did, however, nip hard at Ogechi's fingers, startling her. She hadn't given it any teeth. First of fucking all... <laughs> I hope you didn't give teeth to a hair baby. How the fuck do you give teeth to, like, any kind of baby? Is there... Dude, is there, like, a black market for teeth to give babies fucking teeth? That's metal as fuck. Anyways. She wanted more than anything to leave the child in her room, but the strangeness of its cries might draw attention. 
She bundled it up, trembling at the warmth of its belly. It latched onto her nape with a powerful suction that blurred her vision. Why did I underline that one too? It, oh my god. Powerful suction that blurred her vision. Ain't that what we all want, folks? Come on now. <laughs> Jesus. This is the sort of thing that a mother should do for her child, Ogechi told herself, resisting the urge to yank the baby off her neck. Just more of that, like, just hilariousness. A mother should give all of herself to her child, even, it re even if it requires the marrow in her bones. Especially a child like this, strong and sleek and shimmering. After a few minutes, the sucking eased to something manageable. <laughs> Why am I underlining the dirtiest fucking lines? The sucking eased into something manageable. The child sated. Next page. Oh, end of part eight and uh, beginning of part nine, too. At the Emporium, Ogechi kept the child with her, worried that it would cry if she removed it. Besides, the brash assistant who had tried to uncover the child was no... L I... Holy shit, I cannot read in time... Nice. Timeness? What is my brain? Besides, comma, the brash assistant who had tried to uncover the child was no longer at the shop, and Ogechi knew that she would never return. The other assistant was red-eyed and sniffling, unable to stop even after Mama gave her dirty looks. By lockup, Ogechi's head was throbbing and she trembled with exhaustion. She wanted to get home and pry the baby off of her. She was anticipating the relief that, that when the remaining assist- Again, why can- I cannot read out loud. She was anticipating the reef- The reef? As in fucking coral? What is happening? She was anticipating the relief of that when the remaining assistant said, Why have you not asked after her? Who? Stupid answer, she thought as soon as she uttered it. What do you mean, who? My cousin that disappeared. Why haven't you wondered where she is? Even mom has been asking people about her. I didn't know you were cousins. The girl recognized Ogechi's evasion. You know what happened to her, don't you? What did you do? The answer came out before Ogechi could stop it. The same thing I will do to you, she said, and the, assist the assistant took a step back, then another, before turning to run. Again, Ogechi just being a fucking icon and just, like, fucking with people. It's so funny. Also, why the fuck did she say that? Like, I, I get that she annoys you, but, like, why the fuck did you straight up threaten her? Like, first of all, that is incriminating as fuck. Second of all, girl, what? Anyways... At home, Ogechi put the child to bed and stared until it slept. She felt its belly, which was cooling now, and recoiled at the thought of what could be inside. Then it gasped a little hairy gasp from its little hairy mouth, and Ogechi felt again a mother's love. End part 9, begin part 10. The next morning, it was Ogechi's turn to open the store, and she went in early to bathe the baby with, it, with Mama's fine shampoo. Sudsing its te uh, textured face, avoiding the bite of that hungry, hungry mouth. She was in the middle of rinsing off the child when the other assistant entered. She retreated in fear at first, but then she took it all in. Ogechi at the sink, Mama's prized shampoo on the ledge, Suds covering Mother Knows What, and she turned, sly, running outside and shouting for Mama, knowing that it was no use calling after her. Ogechi quickly wrapped the baby back up in her old torn-up dress, knocking over the shampoo in her haste. That was when Mama walked in. I hear you washing something in my sink. Mama looked at the spilled bottle, then back at Ogechi. You are doing laundry in my place? I'm sorry, Mama. How sorry are you, Ogechi, my dear? Mama said, calculating. Are you sorry enough to give me some of the happiness so that we can forget all of this? Next page. Last page, by the way. There was no need for a song now, as there were no new child. There was no new child to be blessed. Mama simply stretched her hand forward and held on, but what she thought was Ogechi's shoulder was the head of the swaddled child. Uh oh! Mama fell to the ground in undignified shudders. Her eyes rolled. Don't don't all of ours, as she were as if she, as, as. Yeah, as. Her eyes rolled as if she were trying to see everything at once. Dope-ass line. Ogechi fled. She ran all the way home, and even through her panic, she registered the heat of the child in her arms, like the just-stoked embers of a fire. In her room, she threw the child into its bed, expecting to see whorls of burned flesh on her arms, but finding none. 
She studied the baby, but it didn't look any different. It was still a dense tangle of dark fiber with the occasional streak of red. She didn't touch it, even when the mother, even when the mother in her urged her to. At any moment, Mama would show up with her goons, and Ogechi was too frightened to think of much else. But Mama didn't appear, and she fell asleep waiting for pounding at her door. End part 10, begin part 11, the final part. Ogechi woke in the middle of the night with the hair child standing over her. It should not have been able to stand, let alone haul itself onto her bed, nor should it have been able to fist her hair in a grip so tight her scalp puckered on or stuff an appendage into her mouth to block her screams. First of fucking all, that's no longer a baby. That's Freddy fucking Krueger or some bullshit, because first of fucking all, <laughs> that is a blob of hair. Hair doesn't generally do that shit, last time I checked. Second, holy fuck, do you now see why I'm covering this story? It gets metal as fuck for no reason, and I love it. Well, it has a reason, but I fucking love it. It's so fucking good. All right. She tried to tear it apart, but the seams held. Only when she rammed it into the wall did it let go. It skittered across the room and hid somewhere that the candle lit, that the candle she lit couldn't reach. Ogechi backed towards the door, listening. But what noise does hair make? Again, it's just like... I need this to be a horror movie or, like, a short film fucking yesterday. Like, a little hair demon thing skittering across the wall. Oh my god, it's so good. When the hair child jumped onto Ogechi's head, she shrieked and shook herself, but it gripped her hair again, tighter this time. She then did something that would follow her all her days. She raised the candle and set it on fire. When the baby fell to the ground, writhing, she covered it with a pot and held it down, long after her fingers had blistered from the heat, until the child, as tough as she made it, stopped moving. This bitch put her kid in the incinerator. And at the end of the day, isn't that what population control is all about? <laughs> no, but that's so fucking metal. Like, she fucking lit her head on fire, chucked it onto the floor, grabbed a pot, and just, like, fucking threw it on top of the baby and held it. It's, oh my god, it's so good. Need this to be a movie. Outside, she sat on the little step in front of the entrance to her apartment. No one had paid any mind to the noise. There wasn't, this wasn't the sort of building where one checked up on screams. Super fucking questionable, by the way. Like, what is happening down in this apartment? Knees to her chin, Ogechi sobbed into the calloused skin, feeling part relief, part something else. A sliver of empathy Mama hadn't been able to steal. There was so much dirt on the road, so much of it everywhere, all around her. When she turned back into the room and lifted the pot, she saw all those pretty shiny strands transformed into ash. Then she scooped dirt into the pot and added water. This she knew, how to make firm clay, something she was born to do. When the mix was just right, she added a handful of the ashes. Let this child be born in sorrow, she told herself. Let this child live in sorrow. Let this child not grow into a foolish, hopeful girl with joy to barter. Ogechi formed the head, the arms, the legs. She gave it her mother's face. In the morning, she would fetch leaves to protect it from the rain. The end. Do you guys see what I mean when I tell you this shit was metal as fuck? Like, the last part alone just makes this story perfect, you know? Like, the first part of part 11 is classic horror movie shenanigans, the fucking demon baby, like, the whole fight scene. And then the end, that last little chapter there, like, the last two chapters, or not chapters, the last two, like, little uh, paragraphs, it just ties in the whole thing together. This whole time, she's been, like, struggling with her identity as a, quote, mud baby. And, like, oh, she's not deserving of love, blah, blah, blah. And she's just not accepting herself. But now she realizes... That in striving for this, like, perfect baby made of, like, just obscure shit, she could have just made a regular, normal child that she's gonna love no matter what, you know? And she, the, the, uh, the whole, like, putting the ashes into the baby thing, in my opinion, it's a little questionable, but I think the, there's, I don't think there's any implications into, like, the demon coming back or anything from the ashes. I don't think that was the point. I think the point, uh, like, thematically, 
is to show that she's learning from her lesson of not fucking around and finding out, and that she wants this child, born in sorrow, to be a reminder to her, at least, of what she has been thriving for, perfection, and how perfection isn't dictated by what you make your baby out of, or even what your life circumstances are. Perfection is simply what you want it to be. Not even what you want it to be, because what you want it to be can be blurred by greed or pride or whatever. Perfection is just what you need to be. You can't ask for more or less than what you have. You can't ask for more or less than what you will have. All you can do is find the perfect spot of contempt, not contempt, content and happiness and love for the people that are around you and the people that make you happy. And I think with that, we are going to end this episode because what time? I think that's like just past 55 minutes. So uh, let me think if there's any final notes I have. Um, Yeah, no, like just the writing in general, like the writing style, the words used, like all this stuff. It's so fucking good. Like this could so easily be turned into a script of some short and made into like a movie. Dude, it's so fucking good. So, yeah, just like the the writing, amazing. The story, fucking metal as fuck. I love it. The characters, awesome. Like, yeah, we only really get to see Ogechi's character, kind of. Like, no, th- there's not a lot of dynamic character writing here. But it's like, what, 12? Yeah, it's only 12 pages. You You don't get a lot of opportunity to build very complex characters in so little time, especially when there's, like, this much story and lore packed into it. So for what's for, so for the length that it is and what it's trying to do, I think it fucking nails it, you know? And the themes are just so good. Really universal ideals about perfection and what the cost of perfection and creation is, you know? Um, I could make, like, a whole other episode about how it compares to Frankenstein, if you want that, Bella. Yeah, I'm just gonna call you by your- you're the only one listening to this, you know? So if you want that, I could definitely make part two where I'm comparing it to Frankenstein. But, until then, peace out, motherfuckers! We out here!